Cliches are an inevitability in the entertainment medium, because the more audiences consume, the more familiar they become with successful formulas. This is certainly true in the world of video games too, which have cashed in on familiar narrative and gameplay tropes for literal decades. Though while cliches often get a bad rap, they don't always have to be viewed negatively. Because as much as we all love unique storytelling and cutting edge gameplay, there's a major bankable appeal to familiarity. Be it a tried and tested plot that still works, or using expected gameplay mechanics to ensure that the player knows what they're getting themselves into. Obviously there are many tropes that are deeply terrible, and there are those that have certainly outstayed their welcome, but there are tons that continue to be useful and above all else entertaining to millions of people. You might not want to admit it to others or even yourself, but I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com and these are 10 video game cliches that we secretly love. Number 10, the suspiciously generous item drop. One of the most common video game cliches of all time occurs when the player enters a room and finds an over generous or suspicious amount of health items and equipment all for the taking. This is basically video game shorthand for gear up because something is about to go down, and almost always signifies that a challenging boss fight or encounter is just a room or two away. This trope is frequent across pretty much all action centric games, and though on the one hand it might seem like a lazy way to keep things balanced, it also helps give us a heads up that something more focused and intense is right around the corner. Though occasionally subverted for comedic effect like in Borderlands the pre-sequel, or working as a dramatic surprise like Andrew Ryan's confrontation in Bioshock, for the overwhelming majority developers will shower potions, weapons and armour on players, then throw them up against some gigantic slobbering monster with more health than the previous five sub-bosses combined. Number 9, Collectathons and Grinding In recent years, countless AAA games have ramped up their efforts to keep players glued to the screen for as long as possible, through the tried and tested carrot on a stick method. That is, constantly hurling another task at the player in order to elongate the experience. Open world games, especially those made by Ubisoft, are the most obvious offenders, with so many franchises all having icon littered maps. But even the super tame Super Mario Odyssey can turn into a completionist nightmare if you decide to go for that full 100%. All of this dodges the turn up selling elephant in the room though, Animal Crossing. With New Horizons we saw the most popular entry yet, but base gameplay literally boils down to doing as many menial tasks as possible. Watering flowers, selling stock, hitting a rock with a shovel to get crafting components, it sounds like a living hell, but weirdly, it really works. The reason? Well, beyond sheer psychological addiction, people simply love the comfy warm blanket of familiarity and repetition. Just switching your brain off after a hard day and grinding some loot or farming XP might be monotonous, but it's weirdly relaxing, because you feel as though you're actually accomplishing something, no matter how meager or demanding it might be in the moment. Number 8. Ridiculous Character Costumes It's fair to say that the overwhelming majority of video game characters are designed more for fashion than function. Above all else, publishers want their games to feature heroes and villains who are memorable, or otherwise stand out in a sea of other things that you could be playing instead. Over the years, that's resulted in tons of hilariously over-designed characters who, while looking cool or quote-unquote sexy, have no practical application whatsoever. On the female side, you've got cat suits and half-naked adventurers, with the males bearing a ton of flesh as they wade into battle. Final Fantasy likes to make entire costumes out of belts for literally everybody, and I highly doubt that your custom RPG character is anything other than a scantily clad mound of pure escapism. Because really, would we want it any other way? Gaming is escapism through and through, and providing you're not being dehumanizingly objectifying, let that creativity fly. I love The Last of Us and Gone Home, but I'll also take a half-naked zombie in a cowboy hat robbing a bank in Saints Row 3. Number 7, You Are The Chosen One the chosen one trope is one of the most common cliches in all of entertainment, where the protagonist learns that they, and only they, are the single most special person around who can vanquish the villain, save the day, and bring balance to the universe. It's such a widespread narrative device because it allows writers to organically unfill the world to both the player and protagonist simultaneously, rather than having to awkwardly thrust exposition on you that the main character already knows. This stuff has run its course in film, but it's much easier to go with in games because it's always going to be you that's making all the moves. Seeing a character grow from humble origins to a glorified superhero by game's end is enormously satisfying, though the jury is still out on whether we're sick of every other main character also being an amnesiac. Number 6, The Nintendo Rule of Three Once you know this, you cannot unknow it. 
Rules of three apply to so many facets of human interaction, but in gaming it's a given that, especially in Nintendo games, you're gonna have to exploit a boss's weakness three times. In almost every major Nintendo adventure game, you'll need to land three attacks against most major bosses, typically by jumping on their head in order to defeat them. Why? Because one isn't enough, two feels half-baked, but three is just right. Human psychology dictates that we just ruddy love threes. Trilogies are more satisfying than quadrilogies, stories in general have have a beginning, middle and end, even this entry in my script has three main paragraphs. Three switches to unlock a door, three items for a side quest, three pieces of armour for the full set. It's like seeing the Matrix code governing life itself. Number 5. The Point of No Return Older video games are infamous for stranding players without sufficient resources to complete the final section. So now it's become incredibly common for most AAA epics to let you know that you're near the end with a blinking neon sign. Typically, you'll be met with a message that literally states, this is the point of no return, do you still wish to continue? While handy, it's become a way to makeshift some tension for that final duel. A way to force you into seeking out every last mission before the credits, as chances are you'll not be coming back after. With all this in mind though, I'm going to pass it down to the comments. Do you guys like it when a game flags its ending, or are you glad for the warning? So many times it's put me in a state of realising I want to see the end of the story, but I don't want to be locked out of everything else. I end up finishing just to see how things go, only to realise that warning was a lie and I'm back in the open world, or I can choose some levels anyway. What do you guys think? Number 4. Double Jump The double jump is one of the most common mechanics across all of gaming, yet when it's applied to something with a more serious context, it looks incredibly weird, but we're always glad for it. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Doom Eternal, apparently even Cyberpunk 2077 will have a double jump, and yet it feels off that these characters can kick off absolutely nothing and keep going. Also, give me a game with a double jump and air dash and that thing will sing in terms of flow. Double jumping becomes second nature, an unspoken carryover that we don't question as gamers, but animation wise, it's literally never looked right. Number 3. The End Game Boss Rush Ending a video game with one epic boss fight against a single villain is one thing, but sometimes developers decide that that just isn't good enough. They'd rather throw an exhausting army of bosses at you one by one. There's no greater offender of this than Square Enix, who love to do it in pretty much every game they release. Even the Final Fantasy VII Remake has an optional VR combat simulator where you can fight off against all the game's summons in a row before taking on a secret experimental mech. You might be fighting for around an hour or two of concentrated play, and while losing near the end is soul destroying, beating anything like this is practically going on my tombstone. Number 2. The Hero Can't Swim now I know we filmed a chatty face video where Josh admitted he secretly loves swimming in games without mentioning swimming in water levels because I love them but I think that's more to do with me just loving getting wet. But that is literally the only time I've ever heard a human say such a thing. I can only think of one game, the first God of War, where swimming was tolerable. And that's because you were given a boost to get through it quicker. Metal Gear Solid 2, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, even The Last of Us grinds to a halt while you dive around looking for a pallet for Ellie to stand on. All of this is to say that while I also can't stand death by way of dipping a toe into any body of water like in the first Red Dead Redemption, at least it lets you know that there are zero swimming sections to come. While it's undeniably stupid that most of the galaxy's greatest heroes are undone by water like they've come from the War of the Worlds alien planet, it saves us the pain of yet another terrible water level. Seriously, if you can think of a water level that you genuinely loved and enjoyed and you're not Josh Brown, let me know down in the comments. And number one, thirsty supporting characters. I'm speaking more on behalf of the internet for this one as holy hell did people love thirsty ass Jesse in Final Fantasy VII's remake. I'm more of a Tifa man myself, and also I have a wife. This stuff nearly always goes down well though. Metal Gear was doing it with every character other than Snake in the late 90s, Mass Effect had so much thirst it resulted in the will bang okay memes, and most of the time in a game if two characters are in the same room together, they're probably gonna get it on. Mass Effect 3's Kelly Chambers, literally everyone talking to Bayonetta, God of War 3's Aphrodite, or just the average bartender in an RPG. Game developers love making you feel like the centre of attention, and and that means more sex appeal than a Dante sandwich. And those have been my picks for video game cliches we just can't seem to shake, but we kinda love them anyway. Let me know your favourites down in the comments below and please check out the What Culture Gaming podcast. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com and I'll catch you soon.